Prof. Cook, we are live. Yes, I'm. I see so. And with that, um, with that flag from our our, our wonderful uh, um, assistant uh, ICT um, colleague Kelly, um, may I wish you all a very warm welcome to this webinar series. My name is Prof. Richard Cook, and we're delighted that we are able to host this eight-part series. Um, hosted by the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care alongside the Adler Museum of Medicine. Can-do chameleons, colleagues, really are our third webinar series after running the, the Pandemic Pangolins and the Imagining Innovations, two very successful series run over the last couple of years. And now as we head into the second uh, half of the year, the second semester within the WITS context, we're hosting this eight-part series. Really delighted to be doing so because it is the 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 very can-do attitude um, of our of of our VIT stakeholders, but both external as well in the entire health system that we work within, that has has got us through some quite um, significantly difficult times. Now, so because chameleons have a unique ability, I'm sure you'll appreciate, able to adapt and change to their particular context in order to better fit and into the system and to be able to deal with health system challenges. And many of the challenges that are impacting our health system can be, can be, can be viewed from, from a, in, in a positive, through a positive lens because they represent challenges. They represent challenges, but they represent opportunities that we can, in order for us to, to solve, to come up with new ways of thinking, new ways of doing, in, other, in order to take the, the health system to a better place to improve and improve the outcomes of our communities uh, in, in the South African context. So we'll be having these engaging discussions um, within the context of this webinar every second Wednesday until approximately the end of October. You'll, you would have noted that there's a, a, a PDF of the program that um, has, been, has been shared with you, and we'll post that in the, in the chat as well so that you, you have an upfront uh, idea of the upcoming series uh, or upcoming sessions in this, in this series. We also must note that there, we have the VITS Where To site that, has kept, that captures each of our, our, um, our uh, webinars, each of these particular sessions of the series, and the other the other two are on that same um, on on that same um, um, on that same Vits where to um, platform, and we'll look to also post that as it's just been done. Pearl, thank you very much. Um, in in our in our chat, so in the chat now we've got both the the upcoming sessions and we've got the the address for the for the Vits where to platform on which we'll we can uh, you'll you'll see these sessions. So as well with that in mind, um, we'll be recording this session so that then we have it for those who can't attend today, but also for us to be able to return, um, return to any one of us and others to return to um, during the, during the, uh, during at future times. So please do explore the, 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 that particular site and that particular, those, what, what that, the, the, the resources that are there, which don't only include, to be honest, this, these particular three series that I speak of, these three webinars, but a number of other resources as well. So with that, um, I'm delighted and really excited that this is, that we're kicking off this webinar series. Um, and let's get to the to, to the, the more important colleagues on the, on the call than certainly myself. And let me hand over to our, to our hosts for the day, Stephen Pence and indeed Pearl and Dorf. Thank you, Stephen and Pearl. Thank you, Prof. Cook, and welcome everybody to this um, first uh, se session. Just as a quick introduction, my name is Stephen Pence. I'm a lecturer in health system science in the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care. Health system science as a field of study is a multidisciplinary field. It's sometimes considered the third pillar in health science education, and it addresses complexity in health systems by looking at the interrelationships between different aspects within health systems, um, including healthcare structures and processes, healthcare policy, economics and management, health informatics and information technology, population and public health, value-based care, and health information, uh, health systems improvement, just to name a few. And some of these uh, themes will be emergent through the series. 
The discipline also draws on a range of other fields of study, including history, anthropology, sociology, economics, management, and complexity science, and many others. This week, the focus of our discussion is on critical caring. The discourse of health systems tends to be a pragmatic one. It looks at efficiencies and effectiveness, structures, processes, and outcomes. And the aims of effective health systems emphasize a triad of improving experiences of care, improving population health, while reducing per capita cost. And the metrics for assessing and functioning health systems run the risk of negating the needs and experiences of healthcare workers within the system, undervaluating the metrics of care for the system itself. And this begs the question, in what context um, of a system of care, or in the context of a system of care, um, who cares for the system uh, and for those who work within it? Uh, and that is kind of the catalyst for our discussion today. I'm also joined by a co-host, Pearl and Lovu, who is an instructional design intern in our department. Um, and uh, Pearl is uh, one of a, a number of interns who have been working on some really exciting projects, assisting with the development and design of new courses and building a huge capacity to support blended learning within our faculty. I'd like to hand over to Paul now to introduce our guest speakers and to get the ball rolling. Over to you, Paul. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Stephen. Um, so I'd like to welcome our two speakers, Salima Valiani, who is an independent researcher of world historical political economy with specializations in health, care, and mineral-based development. Dr. Villani has published prolifically and is the recipient of a number of prestigious awards. She is also a published poet. Dr. Valiani served as a researcher and economist in unions, non-governmental organizations, and think tanks in Canada and South Africa from 2001 to 2019, and is now research associate with the Reimagining Reproduction Project at the Center of the Advancement of Scholarship at the University of Pretoria. A huge welcome to you, Salima. Our second speaker, Maya Jansen van Rensburg, is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Johannesburg. Growing up with the doctor in the making for a sister, she developed a keen interest in the lives of medical professionals in South Africa. And her current research concerns emergency medical services personnel in Johannesburg. Her academic interest in the political economy of health runs parallel to her concerns regarding the working conditions, safety, and dignity of healthcare providers in South Africa. You're most welcome today, Maya. Um, I'm going to run us through some logistics at the moment. So in terms of logistics, each speaker will have 10 to 15 minutes to present um, some ideas, after which we will take the liberty of prom prompting a discussion between the two speakers. And then we'll invite questions and comments from the floor. Please feel free to post comments and questions in the Q&A tab. At this moment, I am going to hand over to our first speaker. Welcome once again, Salima, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm just going to share my screen. Hmm. Oh my goodness, I seem to have my video. Okay, the video is working. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I seem to have closed down the presentation. I am reopening and sharing. And we begin. Our title today, Critical Caring, 
breathing life into the system. I want to propose something provocative that COVID-19 has actually breathed some life into our thinking about care. We have through COVID-19 begin to understand the critical overlap of issues that are related to care. So on the one hand, we re-recognized unpaid care, the importance of unpaid care through COVID, but also the importance of paid care leave. How do people care for people with COVID if they don't have the safety and the security of paid leave from their jobs. We were awakened to the notion of, of caring for the elderly thoroughly, not minimally. And this is linked to paid care leave, caring for children. Uh, we were awakened to the importance of ventilation in public spaces, another form of care. Now, it's not only about unpaid care, though, as we uh, were, again, reawakened to the importance. I'm talking about the general population, not only people involved in healthcare provision. So we were reawakened to the notion of adequately resourced health system. So it's not only about doctors, it's about nurses. It's not only about creating and filling the jobs of these important workers, but it's about protecting these workers through a pandemic and preparing for that protection by assuring a full, fully fledged health uh, worker population before the pandemic. We can't hire people during the pandemic and expect to have enough resources at play. We were reminded of the importance of medical supplies in the prevention of a pandemic spread, whether it's vaccines, whether it's N95 masks, and I've written about the importance of non for nonprofit production and distribution of these medical supplies. We were awakened to the notion of um, the impact of alcohol on the health system, but not only that, the importance of food for people to fight the pandemic. We were awakened to the notion of health literacy so how do we vaccinate the population? How do we assure that people prevent the spread of COVID between themselves through masking? Well, it's through health literacy. We were awakened to the notion or the importance of addictions, caring for addictions, because simply that banning the alcohol does not get to uh, the, the root of the problem. And let me outline one more big realm of care that we see in that, in those concentric circles, care beyond human life. So the importance of, of caring for the life around us and the link between not doing that caring and the rise of zoonotic diseases, of which COVID may be one, along with SARS-1 and many other pandemics and epidemics that have uh, arisen in recent decades. So environmental destruction and forging new ways. So as a researcher and a feminist, for me, I wanted to take these critical, critically overlapping realms of care and create something we can use to spark discussions around how we can strengthen 
systems, and societies as a whole. So I came up with the Care Economy Index. So looking at care as an economy, an entire economy, embracing these various aspects of care that I've just outlined generally, care as a whole. The premise here is that a single issue approach is inadequate. We cannot only look at unpaid care, only look at the health system, only look at food security, only look at environmental destruction and protection. We need a way to tackle care as a whole. Let me go to a story that is a true story. All the identifiers have been changed to assure anonymity, but it's a very interesting story to think about, particularly here in South Africa in light of the Banyana, Banyana victory. Jane, a licensed massage therapist in Africa, traveled overseas to support her country's team in a world competition of mobility impaired sports. On arrival, Jane was given the responsibility of providing medical care, something she was not trained for nor told about in advance. One player, Sylvia, suffered from recurring wounds that needed regular dressing. Taught from a young age to dress her own wounds by nurses over the years, Sylvia gave tips to Jane on what to do. Attempting to learn fast on the job and under pressure to assist several players, Jane supplemented Sylvia's tips by watching YouTube videos. Sylvia lost a limb after enduring a burn by boiling water as an infant. Daughter of a single working mother who lacked funds for a child minder, Sylvia was in the care of two other children when the accident happened. The details of how the burn occurred were never known. On returning from the competition, overwhelmed by the trying experience, Jane cried for two days. Sylvia's remaining limb was amputated as it came to be understood that the recurring infections were due to tissue that had never healed after the burn. After the amputation, Sylvia felt liberated, though she never played for the national team again. I think this, this account is something that we can imagine in many parts of the continent and in many different walks of life, different faces, different details. But this is the overlap of, of many of the forms of care that I'm talking about. So I decided to devise an index to evaluate every single country in the continent, and this can be done anywhere in the world, on the way that society is handling the question of care. What you have here is a scorecard, so the way that countries have been evaluated in this index. Let me go through them quickly. Metric one, the very basic form of, of care, maybe the very beginning, maternity and parental leave. The check marks you see on the right are the number of points accorded to each, each measure. The next metric, socialized child care, which very much comes through in the account I just read to you. Again, four points there, given that the population of young people in Africa generally is, is, is very large and growing, and will this, this, this trend will continue for several decades to come. 
socialized care for the elderly. If we look at North and Southern Africa, we see that the elderly population will increase much quicker than the other parts of Africa. So uh, this is an important category for Africa, but not as important as socialized childcare. We then have three points for that metric. Metric four, socialized care for people living with disabilities. Again, a theme touched on in the account. We don't have very good figures around how many people are living with disabilities in the continent. Some estimates are as high as 40%. So again, we have three points for that metric. Socialized health care. Everybody here will understand the crucial importance of that. Four points for socialized health care. Socialized food production. So this is the question of how states support the production of food for the local population. And given the issues of climate change, environmental destruction in the continent, the question of food production is not a simple one, and one that is handled predominantly by women in much of the continent. Without public support in that area, we cannot assure proper nutrition, which is key to health, uh, mental development, all, all sorts of uh, aspects of life, uh, which begin with food. COVID care measures. So I have measured there for each country uh, the types of measures taken by governments around paid care leave, around um, time off, and so on, support for homes, residences of the elderly, other people that would be abandoned during the, the pandemics. Metric eight is domestic worker production protection. So for the households that are privileged enough to have help with unpaid care at home, how well are those workers protected, respected? Metric nine is care grants and subsidies. So short of all the previous metrics, how do, how do, do societies recognize care and remunerate that care through grants and subsidies. I have only two points there because it's a highly inadequate way of recognizing and respecting care. Finally, family care leave, which is accorded 1.5 points. Why? Because this is uh, given to workers who are in the so-called formal economy, and this is very few workers within the African continent, and somewhat more depending on the country that you're in. We have then a total of 30 points. The passing grade, I have argued, is 18 out of 30. Why? Let me go back to the previous screen. The argument is that if we had done well from metric one to metric six, then as societies, we would have been prepared and able to take on the global pandemic, which is ongoing. So, Full points in metrics one to six would give you 18 out of 30. What are the results for African countries? Not a single African country makes even half of the minimum pass. And you see the distribution there. The highest points go to Burkina Faso, 7.25. Then come Ethiopia, and so on. 
35 countries in the continent have less than four out of 30. As uh, the Professor Cook said in the very beginning, we need to see these challenges as opportunities. And that opportunity I bring out in the various recommendations of the, of the uh, Africa Care Economy Index. So the index needs to be seen as a tool for accountability, holding our states responsible, our societies as a whole responsible, and unity so that all of us in our various quarters of care, whether we're performing, whether we're receiving, whether we are needing, the index is a means for us to come together to advocate for socialized care as an economy. How do we unite? <laughs> One of the very basics is we need to collectively define need. This is on a national and a subnational and even uh, lower level levels. What are the needs in our particular communities, cities, provinces, what have you? How do we respond to those needs in culturally and socially appropriate ways? For example, what does socialized childcare look like in Africa, where there are many forms of collective care already in existence, but not supported by the state and otherwise, very concentrated amongst women. <clears throat> so what does socialized ch childcare look like? And this will vary from place to place. Again, the argument is that alone in our own quarters of care, we don't have enough political clout. We become interest groups without the power to really change the attention and support given to these various forms of care. I will stop there. And look forward to your questions, particularly, I, I hope somebody will ask me about socialized care. What does that mean? Uh, and how do we afford all of this? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Salima, for that uh, broad overview. I thought it was very interesting uh, to be thinking through metrics that, that um, are often undervalued or, or not necessarily brought into consideration. Um, sure, it has stimulated a huge amount of thought. Um, I would like to hand over to our second speaker, uh, Mia Janssen van Rensburg, who's um, joining us from UJ. Um, to take us on a slightly different journey, but I think we could probably draw some parallels between what you've been discussing and the work um, in a very deep ethnographic sense. Um, uh, how, if we look very um, uh, from the from a detailed perspective outwards, how we can find some commonalities. So, Mia, let me hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I'm very excited to be here and I really look forward to our discussion today. Um, I'll jump right in because I know that we're very limited on time. Um, I'll start with video on and then switch to a slideshow later if that's fine. So as has been said, my research focuses primarily on the emergency medical services in Johannesburg. In uh, June of 2020, I had a conversation with a paramedic who I call Haley Coleman. And she gave me some very good advice, uh, but advice that I had thought would be quite obvious. And that was that you should never ask a medic what the worst thing is they've ever seen. Um, so of course I asked her, do you get that question a lot? And she said, yes. I usually tell them it's the paycheck or the paperwork. So this conversation uh, took place in Haley's office in Northern Johannesburg on the third, fl third floor <laughs> of the headquarters of Aframed that's a pseudonym, as are all the names I'll be using here. Uh, Aframed is a for-profit ambulance service where I hope to conduct research concerning the emergency medical services in this city. Um, our meeting had taken some time to arrange. Haley, like everyone else at Aframed seemed to be, was always very, very busy. 
Um, she was both the operations manager and a paramedic and administrator. Uh, so she was responsible for um, patients and schedules and also this endless paperwork. And then for me too, <laughs> after that conversation, she gave me indemnity forms to sign, instructions about dress code and a few words of advice. Haley, who at 23 had already been held at gunpoint on the job, told me that I should keep my eyes up and my back to the ambulance on scene, especially at night. And even more importantly, if the medics didn't like me, I should offer to make them coffee. So in the following months, I spent upwards of 200 hours at Aphromed. I accompanied medics on their 12 hour shifts. And I also spent some time on the administrative side of the business to get a handle on how things worked upstairs in the offices. I also conducted interviews with medics in the public and private and nonprofit sectors. What I was trying to do was learn about the healthcare system from the bottom up, from the everyday work of the emergency medical services. I thought that um, we could start with the perspectives of workers and work up from there to look at the bigger forces that structure their everyday lives. Now, this was back in 2020. My um, field work started in June of that year, right as we were headed into the peak of uh, the first wave of COVID in South Africa. But my intention had not actually been to study the pandemic. Uh, I wrote the proposal for this research uh, quite a while before COVID arrived in South Africa and before COVID had even been declared a pandemic. So at the time of my field work, this already, our already strained healthcare system was, uh, I knew I was heading into the private sector, so I expected things to be generally less hectic than in the public sector. What I did not expect was that at Aphromed, often entire 12 hour shifts would go by without the medics being dispatched even once. And uh, it seemed that a shift where you actually went out on a call was the exception rather than the rule. So I did spend the vast majority of my 200 hours at Aphromed watching Netflix and eating garage pies and chain smoking with medics at the base. Um, in Johannesburg, where people sometimes wait for hours for an ambulance, in a city of permanently neglected emergencies, <laughs> and at the time in the midst of a pandemic, there were medics with, with nothing to do. Now, this is a, a really, really weird situation, and it felt very surreal to be in it, um, especially, you know, reading the news and speaking to doctors I knew. It, it didn't really gel. It uh, shouldn't really be surprising, though. Like any business, Aphromed, companies like Aphromed are governed by the two fundamental necessities of private enterprise, maximizing gains and minimizing losses. This means ultimately two things, the commodification of care for the billable, those who can either afford private health care or are covered by some other means, and the production of abandonment for the unbillable, those who can't afford private care. And what gets lost in all of this is actual care, actual human care. And of course, the obvious uh, version of this is that abandonment, right? People who have no access to care through the private sector. But I would argue it's also true for people who do buy care from the private sector. The profit motive I found in my research inevitably muddles relationships of care. It creates inevitably perverse incentives. So my question really comes down to what does all of this mean for healthcare workers themselves? What happens when people who have chosen a caring professions, a caring profession, find themselves constrained in their ability to truly care. I think the best way to illustrate what I'm trying to get at is with a story about two medics, Alex, Alice, sorry, Alice and Marco. One Sunday I was working a day shift with them and it was one of those shifts where we didn't get any calls at all. Alice and I had spent the morning on the couch paging through Netflix and trying to decide whether we should watch a true crime documentary or a game show. And while we did that, Marco slouched in the office chair, scrolling through his phone. He was looking at WhatsApp groups and the Namola app. Now, these WhatsApp groups are, um, sorry, 
these WhatsApp groups consist of first responders of all kinds. So you have cops and firefighters and security companies and a lot of medics in both the private and public sector together in a group. And then they're kind of a DIY dispatch sent uh, system. So someone will post about an emergency and then someone else will say, okay, cool, we'll send someone. Marco started reading the emergencies that he was seeing on the group aloud to us. There were heart attacks and falls and injuries and stabbings, but he was getting more and more frustrated about the fact that we weren't being set out, sent out. These emergencies were happening nearby and he and Alice were not allowed to help. In several cases, it was clear that none of the other private services on the groups were going to help either. This is my first and only shift working with Marco. I worked quite a lot with Alice after that, but Marco was there only as a temp to fill an unexpected gap in the schedule. He had actually worked for Aframed before, but had uh, resigned um, a few months before I arrived. And in large part because of days like this, I would later discover it as Marco and I became friends and I did quite a few interviews with him. He was not alone in resigning in part because of this, this persistent inactivity. I saw quite a few resignations when I was at Aframed and there are always many different things that factor into this. The low dispatch rate was very often one of them along with conflicts with management and issues with low pay. Marco found this particularly difficult, uh, the situation, and he had developed a very deep resentment toward the private sector as a whole. He was very passionate about the emergency medical services. In his free time, he actually responded to emergencies in his own car with his own equipment. <laughs> this habit of his is how we actually ended up running into each other a few months later at the scene of a fatal double drowning. Now, this scene was quite strange. For the fact that about a dozen different organizations, both public and private, had responded. And when we got there, the riverbank already looked like a parking lot. I, I couldn't recognize all of the insignia and I couldn't write them down because I was wearing a hazmat suit type thing. So I couldn't access the notebook without breaking the seal of my PPE. There were uh, various different units and little groups chatting, very casual and relaxed. The first responder to arrive on scene, the first of the first responders to arrive on scene had been too late and could do nothing other than um, remove the, the teenage girls' bodies from the water. Myself and the Aframed medics were wearing by far the most PPE, which is kind of ironic in light of the fact that Aframed almost definitely responded to the least emergencies of everyone there. <laughs> We looked kind of like spacemen, those big white suits, the hoods, the goggles, the mom, face shield, the gloves. Marco, for his part, was wearing shorts and a pair of his arms, who drowned, were laid out on the rocks. Um, they, were, they were naked, but they were covered with space blankets. And I, I noticed that the wind kept flapping them open and exposing the girls, but I was at the time too timid to interrupt anyone to say, and they all had their backs turned, turned to the rocks. But Marco noticed, he was the first of the medics to notice, and he arranged for some rocks to weigh the blanket down. After this, he came over to greet me and ask about my research. He asked me if I'd been going on any good calls. And I told him that management wasn't really sending any of us out. The dispatch rate had been low before the pandemic, but it had gotten lower out of uh, management's fear that any of the workers would be, uh, would contract COVID and then compromise the other activities that uh, are profitable for this business. I was trying to be diplomatic about it when I told him that management was trying to keep us from getting sick. But he shook his head and he asked me, so what about the people who are sick? who's going to help them? I didn't have an answer for that one. <laughs> a while after this conversation, Alice actually also left Aframed. Along with other issues, she was being sued for minor damage done to an ambulance while she was driving, sued by her, by her employer. This seems to be kind of unique to the private sector. Uh, in the private sector, workers are often expected to cover the excess that the insurance doesn't cover in an accident. Uh, they are also generally, as an aside, more medically legally vulnerable than workers in the state sector. She had also been very unhappy about her treatment at Aframed in general. She developed both mental health issues and severe back problems during her time in the EMS, 
which is once again, not uncommon for medics in general. Like many of the private sector medics I've met though, she didn't have health insurance, she couldn't afford it. She also couldn't afford to pay out of pocket for therapy or psychiatric medication or the surgery she needed for her back. At one point, uh, a kind woman on the periphery of her social circles offered to sponsor her, her medication and her therapy. Alice took her up on the offer. At the time, she was working in a kind of middle management role, a dual administrator medic position similar to Hades. She had warned her manager uh, that her doctor had told her that the side effects in this adjustment period would be um, quite severe. Despite this warning, um, when she fell asleep at her desk one day, the fatigue from the medication was really overwhelming, they uh, very promptly demoted her and she took a very significant pay cut. So I met up with her for lunch a few months after she resigned. And when I asked her how things were going at her new job at a different private ambulance service, she told me that things were mostly better. Uh, they went on more calls and the people were nicer, but there was still something she was unhappy about. She told me that she hadn't known beforehand that her new employer practiced financial medicine. What this meant in this case is that the crews were given targets to meet. They had to transport a, a certain number of patients to hospital every month. And that of course resulted in them convincing some people who didn't actually need the hospital that in fact they did. It involves overtreatment. This is uh, not uncommon in the private EMS. It is in fact one study from UJ uh, done in the Department of Emergency Medicine, I believe by Professor Chris Stein, uh, suggests that it might actually be universal practices of financial medicine. Uh, they're very, very difficult to litigate and very difficult to prove. This, is, uh, this makes a bit more sense if you keep in mind the recent history of this industry, because in the last 20 years, the industry for private EMS in Johannesburg in particular has gotten very, very, very competitive for reasons I don't have time to get into. Competition is, of course, generally regarded as a good thing in the free market, but I would argue that this uh, increased competition has made things demonstrably worse for both patients and medics, and also dispatchers, and even the medics who themselves own ambulance services. I, uh, I'm going to take a second to share a video. Sorry, I've ignored the rest of this presentation. Uh, cool. So the video you're looking at right now was posted last year by the owner of a private ambulance service not very far from here. It was posted on his company's official public Facebook page. So what you're seeing is uh, two men throwing a petrol bomb into the headquarters. Now the allegation the owner made in the caption, the allegation he would continue to make in subsequent posts, and the version of events that every other medic I spoke to confirmed unanimously, was that this was the work of a rival ambulance service. This was an expression of business rivalry. <laughs> now, um, it's largely irrelevant whether or not this is the capital T truth, of course, right? Because medics live in a consensus reality in which this is believable believable medics live in a world where ambulance services bomb one another <laughs> so that is that is what i'm getting at when i say the industry is is fiercely competitive there is something profoundly wrong with a healthcare system that creates the conditions for financial medicine and fire bombs and in this system you can have medics being forced to sit around and watch netflix while they read whatsapps about people dying pointless and preventable death a few kilometers away. The question I'm, I'm really concerned with and the question I uh, hope that you all go away from this thinking about is what does the system do to a person who has chosen to take on a job like being a medic? What does it do to you as a human being when you hand someone a credit card machine after performing a declaration of death on their loved one? That's a legal thing to do. It's completely legal to hand someone a credit card machine after you've provided them medical care, but I don't think it feels very good. The conversation about mental health in the EMS can't just center on a, these conventional ideas about trauma, these dramatic moments. Studies have actually shown 
that patient treatment is not necessarily the most important factor in occupational distress in the EMS. Organizational factors and seemingly mundane workplace conflicts and dysfunctions play a really important role. And I, I started this presentation with a joke paramedics often make when they're asked, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? But as the saying goes, many a truth is said in jest. In a lot of ways, I would argue the paycheck and the paperwork really are the worst thing you've ever seen. There's a very real possibility that treating a gunshot wound might be the best part of your day and far less gruesome than writing up the invoice off. <laughs> I'll stop there and uh, Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, I think it was also very thought provoking. Um, we've got some time for questions, but I'm going to abuse my position to ask the first question to both of you. Um, I'm actually thinking around the topic of national health insurance. It's at the back of my head. It's a very hot topic in many people's minds at the moment. Um, and I want to ask uh, first to Mia, um, with paramedics and private EMS, um, I find it um, quite telling that people working as paramedics don't have medical aid and aren't cared for, for themselves. And this in a context where um, the profit motive for financial medicine uh, confines the delivery of true care. Um, and we see once again, these stark divisions between public and private care. Um, do you feel that NHI offers a way out of this conundrum or does it add fuel to the flame? Um, that is meant in jest from that video. <laughs> and similarly, oh, um, if I can ask the same question to, to um, Salima, um, if we think about NHI as a response to the call for universal health coverage um, as underpinned in SDG 3.8, um, this is the need to have equitous access of, to care services. Um, and this idea of coverage is quite different from the idea of care. And that our policy constantly talks about universal health coverage and doesn't really think about how that coverage is actually a form of care. Um, how do we actually build metrics in the way that you've presented to us um, into the future um, health system in the context of NHI. So I'll hand over first to Mia and then to Silima, if you wouldn't mind taking those two points around NHI, um, and then we will take some, some comments and questions from the floor. Cool. Uh, thank you. That's a, so it's a very good question. Um, I think the short version of my answer is the latter. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think the the NHI is going to solve a lot of the fundamental problems we have here. This is something that Salima is going to be able to speak on uh, probably a lot better than, than I can. Anyone who is interested in the viability of a sustainable universal healthcare system, please read Salima's work. It is required reading. Um, the, the issue with the NHI, as opposed to something like an NHS, is that there are a lot of the, the opportunities for profiteering that aren't really eliminated. The issue with trying to regulate away things like over-treatment, things like upgrading of calls, in other words, yeah, offering a higher level of care to charge more, uh, even fraud is often very hard to prove. These things are quite difficult to measure, and there is a very real risk that attempts to regulate this out and establish watchdogs just further diverts away resources that can be more productively used to help patients. I encourage anyone who um, is trying to look at a test case for what the NHI might look like, I encourage them to look at what happens with the road accident fund. Uh, because this is in the EMS specifically, they don't necessarily always defraud the road accident fund, but they do exploit it. You can add a little bit here and there. And yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not efficient. The private sector is extremely inefficient, actually. So I, I am worried about the NHI because I do think this is something one medic told me in his words, it gives them more opportunities to steal. So yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> uh, 
Selima. Okay, thank you. Let me again share my screen. I was hoping that some of this around healthcare in particular would come up. Let me advocate now though for an entire session on the NHI. <laughs> I'm going to answer in a partial way, I think for now. So universal health care is different from universal health coverage. There's a long history to those differences, but ultimately what has occurred in global policy is that universal health care, which is the same services for the entire population, uh, is the type of public health care that has been created in rich countries, not without a long struggle by the average people. Universal health coverage is what we read about in the SDGs, uh, in World Bank documents, in our own government's documents, and it is a stopgap measure to compensate for the defunding of public health care in much of the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America. It is to compensate for the fact that people are spending money out of their pockets for health care and still not getting what they need. Let's look at the way that I measured health care in the Africa Care Economy Index. Looking at the slide, check the box on the right hand side. The African Union committed in Abuja in 2001 to spending a minimum of 15% of public spending on public health care. So when we hear that we can't afford it, we have debts to pay, think again to this commitment made by every member of the African Union to spend 15%. What happened since 2001? This is what I look at in the index. So taking the average between 2002 and 2019, we see that not a single African government met its own target, met its own goal. And a handful of countries spent between 11 and 14% on average. The rest spent less than 11%. So the money is there, the will is not. When we look at a country like South Africa, and you find it in government's health market inquiry, though not emphasized in too many places, the fact that private healthcare is monopolized by three to four different companies that are acting throughout the health system. What the NHI does is it buys business from those monopolies with public money. And this is supposedly to provide coverage to the population as a whole. Well, as middle-class people, most of us here pay those fees every month for our health coverage, private health coverage, we know what we get for it. We get less and less every year while the fees go up. If public health care in South Africa is shifted to buying services from that small group of countries, the money will be gone in a flash. Mia has talked extensively about what happens <laughs> when money goes to those companies. We had another question around um, how we can afford to pay for care as an economy. Uh, the socialized care I was talking about, if you want, I can go into that, otherwise I'll wait. Yes, please, please go ahead. Oh, go into it, okay. So, <clears throat> thank you for the question. 
I want to look quickly at South Africa alone. This is true of the continent as a whole. Wealth has become, and, and the world as we know, but the, the most extreme polarization is in the African continent. And this is about, um, this is about who owns wealth in society. These numbers here are for South Africa. You see the various types of wealth, housing, owned by the top 10%. So over 60% of housing is owned by the top percent. Well, obviously they don't live in all those houses. They are making money on those houses. Pension assets, again, over 60% owned by the top 10%. Stocks and bonds is even more. That polarization, that imbalance of wealth, that is what we talk about when we talk about a wealth tax. A tax on all of this wealth can cover a great deal of socialized care that would then go to the majority. Let's again look only at South Africa. If we brought in a progressive wealth tax on the top 1%, so it means that the top 0.01% would pay more than the rest. If we had a progressive system, uh, I can share the paper that analyzes this. On just the top 1%, we could raise close to 300 million rands annually. This alone would bring public health spending per person up to the world average. So that's about 150% more per person than currently. So the idea that the money is not there is something that we need to discuss, debate, and demythologize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pearl, I know you have some questions to ask from the audience. Can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you so much. Um, Salima and Maya, thank you so much. So um, the first one is one that I will post right now. I have posted it. And it's a question from Haley. She asked initially, she says, is there a platform on which we can follow can do chameleons looking forward to the webinar? Um, Haley, I hope you've, enjoy, you've been enjoying yourself thus far. Um, I will share the link once again to Vids where to where you can follow and um, yes, stay up to date with uh, the Can Do Chameleons series. And then there's another question again from um, Haley, which I will share now. All right, and Haley says, hi, Salima. Your presentation and your work was fascinating. As an anthropologist myself, I'd love to know more about how and what socialized care means as contexts differ from region to region. Also, in countries like South Africa, there are co-occurring systems of private and public health care. Would this influence the metrics of the index? If so, um, how are they considered? Thank you so much for your question, Haley. Um, I will just give Salima a moment to respond to that. Thank you, Haley and Pearl. I am arguing for socialized care across the board. And what this means is that in Africa in particular, we know from time use surveys that women and girls spend far more time on care, far less time on paid work and on education than boys and men. I argue that to reverse this, the only way, uh, this is a normalization of female unpaid labor 
as the response to all major human needs. It's everything from food, supply of fuel, supply of water, care for the young, care for the elderly, and care for those suffering the array of physical and psychological ailments arising from impoverishment and violence. The only way to reverse this normalization, this culture, is on the one hand for the state to support systems of providing that care collectively and remunerating the care providers at a living wage. This is the beginning of changing the culture. There are many other things that are also needed. The, the, the way that this looks, the socialized care shape varies from country to country, region to region, and so on. This is why I'm arguing that we need to collectively define these forms of socialized care in the various categories that I mentioned in those 10 metrics. There's an extensive theoretical discussion about all of this in the beginning of the index. So please do check out the link and have a look at the entire work. It's basically a, a little book. Um, I think that's about it for the question. Thank you. Thanks for that. We actually have run out of time. <laughs> I think we needed a little bit more session, time for the session because it was our inaugural session. We were talking a lot in the beginning, but it has been absolutely fascinating. And I, Prof Cook has left us with, um, with a comment, which I would like to read out um, in terms of our future planning and thinking in the faculty that the faculty of health sciences needs a space in which to see the advocacy needed to promote and protect both the care and the carers in our health system founded in evidence and partnering with key stakeholders the innovative uh, sustainable actions and solutions would simply be obvious and we're here advocating for the need for a center for health system science and advocacy in our own faculty to take some of these issues that are that are discussed further and put them into action and to have a house uh, or a home um, where we can um, really uh, situate many of these key concerns um, through debate through through advocacy work uh, through through increased research. Um, I would also uh, like to just thank both our presenters today for for spending the time to share your insights with us. I think this was a really great way to start um, a seminar series, um, thinking about key aspects of care. I think we could talk about this for quite a lot longer. Um, so thank you for the, the attendees on the call who have stayed on for a few more minutes. We appreciate your time. Um, and please note that we'll be picking up um, with a really exciting discussion in two weeks time on the 10th of August around quality data and why it matters. Um, we will be speaking to the nephrologist Jane, June Fabian with um, one of her colleagues in from Uganda, I think from Uganda at least, um, talking about some really groundbreaking work that's happening in that field um, that's come out of a recent PhD and other really amazing publications in some of the top rated journals. Um, so I would like to encourage you all please to join that session. Um, and you can register right now if you click on the link that's been posted in the chat, um, the details will be there. Um, so once again, thank you so much. Thank you to Pearl for helping me out on the back end here. Much appreciated. Salima and Mia, um, fabulous, fantastic discussion. Um, and we wish you all the best going forward. Thank you all so much. I look forward to the following sessions in the series. Thank you. Keep up the good work. <laughs>